Welcome to The Kill Count, where we tally up the victims in all our favorite horror movies. I'm James A. Janice, and today we're looking at Urban Legend, released in 1998. Urban Legend is a whodunit slasher hurried into production after Scream's massive success. Just like Scream, it features a cast of sexy, well-known young actors playing snarky characters who all get killed. The hook of this movie is that those kills are done in ways that evoke urban legends. It's a great premise, although I do wonder if the Urban Legends referenced are less familiar now than they were a quarter century ago. Do kids still tell each other the pop rocks and soda thing? Does anyone still say Bloody Mary in the mirror? Bloody Mary. Are people still warned against flashing their headlights because of possible gang initiations? Or worry about calls coming from inside the house? I don't know, but I do know that this movie's a good time. A big part of its success is first-time director Jamie Blanks. He'd follow this up with Valentine, which I've already covered on the show. Back in 98, the 26-year-old Australian Blanks was trying to get work off his buzzy student film Silent Number. His manager had tried to get him scream, but he couldn't beat out Wes Craven. He nearly got I Know What You Did Last Summer by making a fake trailer for it, but again, the job went to someone else. His trailer impressed that movie's producer, Neil H. Moritz, though, who was also producing Urban Legend. Moritz hired Blanks to direct a great decision based on how production went. That's how I wish every film experience was, to be honest. Blanks is a huge horror fan, and that love for the genre came through on set and in the film. Urban Legend is fun and and easy to watch, with a great cast and suspenseful scenes, and lots of crane shots. Boy, does he love his crane shots. I'm pretty sure they said at one point, for an extra high shot, they had a crane on top of another crane. That's awesome. I can't stress enough how highly this cast and crew spoke of Blanks, a huge compliment for his first film. He was so good at hiding that. I thought he directed like 10 or 12 movies before he directed that movie. While the direction is great, I don't think the script's quite as craftful as Screams, which it'll always be compared to to as a contemporary. Urban Legend has more forced contrivances to make characters seem suspicious, and a lot of the well-constructed scenes of tension ultimately don't go anywhere. It's fine for mood, but I like my scares to also help move the story forward. I only need one scene of Sydney getting attacked in the bathroom, you know? Still, this Snope slasher is teeming with horror legends, and After I Know What You Did Last Summer is an easy silver medalist in the Scream knockoff Olympics. That's not a bad place to be, and for genre fans of a certain age, this is possible positively a classic. Although, now that I think about it, it is missing my favorite urban legend. The tale of Donnie the Double Dipper, who used the same hair trimmer down below as up above. Luckily, we can bury that urban legend in the past with today's sponsor, Manscaped. After years of keeping your nethers neat, Manscaped is getting into the face follicle game with their all new Beard Hedger. So now, Donnie can rock the lawnmower below and the Beard Hedger above. And the Beard Hedger is way more than just a second trimmer, because it's designed specifically for beard maintenance, thanks to 20 different trim lengths you can choose right from the blade. Plus, with their Pro Kit, you get a full beard care package, including beard shampoo, beard conditioner, beard oil, beard beard balm, beard scissors, beard brush, and a beard comb. And now Donnie will never be thought of as the double dipper again. His legend will fade. He'll be lost to history, forgotten by the passing sands of time. But at least he looks damn good in the meantime. Don't become your own urban legend. Go to manscaped.com and use promo code KILLCOUNT20 for 20% off your order and free shipping. Now let's see if these kills are actually legendary and get to them. The movie begins raining title cards! Hallelujah! Michelle Mancini, named after Chucky creator Don, doesn't think she's driving distractedly enough, so she throws on some bee tie and sings along old school style. Every now and then I get a little bit terrified. I see the fucking look in your eyes! She notices she's running out of gas, so she breaks out the Washingtons, cause it's only a dollar fourteen. Holy 1998. She pulls over at Ye Harbinger Petrol, where the attendant is played by voice of Chucky and all around genre legend. Legend Brad Dourif. He has a stutter, though, making this Mancini distrustful of him. Freak show! Well, now I can't wait for you to die. He sees something in her car, but his stutter prevents him from spitting it out before she's freaked and flying down the road. Someone's in the back seat! That someone rises up with an axe in their hand, and uses it to cause a head-off collision in the front seat. Jamie Blanks was an unproven director. In fact, the first day of shooting was his first day ever on a feature film set. He knew he had to impress the producers and studio right off the bat, so he broke out every rain machine available and a camera crane for some beautiful shots. This opening works great as a short horror film, an excellent similarity to share with its forebearer scream. Helps that it has Brad Dourif, who humored horror fan Blanks by doing the 
Chucky chant on set. A day do we get Bella. <laughs> Give me the power, I beg of you! Back at Pendleton University, final girl Natalie Simon is hanging out with her friends, who you know are gonna be cool and sexy and snarky and eventually dead. Natalie's played by Alicia Witt, who had been a child actor for David Lynch in Dune and Twin Peaks. Her bestie is recent transfer student Brenda Bates, who's crushing hard on college newspaper journalist Paul Gardner. He is such a babe. Paul's played by Jared Leto, long before the rumors of rat gifts and cults in Croatia. It was already a bit of a joke though. Jared, Jared has this, he just loves scaring the girls. <laughs> Jared crept up behind me and all of a sudden he let out this horrible scream and grabbed me around the neck. He was a big get for the cast, already well known for my so-called life. But four years later, in an IGN interview, he'd steadfastly deny being in or even ever hearing of Urban Legend, the fucking weirdo. Natalie's friend Sasha Thomas is played by Tara Reid a year before she'd be much better known from American Pie. Though she had done commercials, her only film prior to this was The Big Lebowski. Sasha hosts a Cosmo-informed sex radio show called Under the Covers. It airs on that new station, K Fellatio. Fellatio. Michelle had been listening to it before she died when a caller alluded to an urban legend about birth control and baby aspirin. Sasha's boyfriend is Parker Riley, played by Michael Rosenbaum, and all these kids love telling urban legends as much as the Scream crowd loves watching horror films. That's why they're all enrolled in Urban Legends 101, taught by Professor Wexler, played by the always enjoyable man of your dreams, Robert England. Wexler's here to explain to everyone what an urban legend is exactly. Contemporary folklore passed on as a true story. He's teaching the legend of, wait, what, Casey Becker? Nope, wrong movie. It's the urban legend about a babysitter who gets calls from inside the house. While the Scream crew would shout out, Black Christmas, or when a stranger calls. The students here make no such movie references. Brenda believes it happened for real and is equally gullible when Wexler offers her pop rocks and soda. Your stomach and your intestines, everything first. Parker's buddy, the bleached clown Damon Brooks, volunteers to test the myth for the class. After guzzling down all that sugar, he he takes a stumble down the steps, but his convulsions are just an epic prank, bro. Haha, <laughs> hope you're happy with a sticky neck, dude. Damon's played by Joshua Jackson, who had just had a small role in Scream 2 the year prior. Same goes for Brenda's actor, Rebecca Gayhart, who was one of the low-key MVP sorority sisters. Meanwhile, Pendleton is played by the University of Toronto. It gives the movie a nice spooky setting with all the gothic architecture. The university was excited to have a movie filmed there and pretty much gave production free reign. It's kind of crazy to think how much freedom we had. It seems like that was the case for everything when it came to making this movie. With Urban Legend, just everything went easy. Phoenix Pictures was a relatively new studio and gave a lot of freedom to the movie's crew, despite many of them being first-time filmmakers like producer Gina Matthews and 24-year-old screenwriter Silvio Horta. Horta would later go on to create and showrun Ugly Betty, but sadly died in 2020. Rest in peace. Paul writes an article about Michelle Mancini's total eclipse of the head, pissing off Dean Adams and security officer Reese. News of the death upsets the students, too, like Damon. I don't miss her, too, because... That girl gave great head. <laughs> you get it? She gave great head? Come on. Liver alone! What? Liver! Liver! Live! It was a joke. Natalie is truly upset about it, though, since she and Michelle used to be cheerleading friends in high school. She doesn't tell her friends that she knew the dead chick, but Damon sees her tears and somehow deciphers, hey, she's sad. He pretends to be a nice guy as he drives her into the woods to talk, where we get a meta nod to Jackson's role in Dawson's Creek. <laughs> Then he tries to deflect Natalie's trauma into getting his dick wet. She punches him, he calls her a bitch, and it's about then he decides to go pee, which is kind of the opposite of getting your dick wet. While draining the lizard, he's accosted from behind. Pretty soon Natalie runs into his parka-clad attacker. She locks them out and starts the car as a rope is tied around the trailer hitch. When she tries to drive, she hears squeaking on the roof, and it ain't cause Damon's installing a moon roof in his shaggin' wagon. Turns out he's being hanged with the rope that's attached to the car. As the car moves forward, he's pulled up higher. It's a reference to an urban legend, of course. Damon is killed when Natalie keeps trying to drive away, and his body ends up crashing through the windshield. The stunts in this movie were headed by coordinator Matt Berman. For Damon's death, they used a techno crane to follow Jackson as he was yanked up with a harness and cables. They had to do a whole bunch of shots a whole bunch of times. <laughs> 
seems like he had a good time doing it. Natalie goes to campus security officer Reese for help, interrupting her special time for coffee and contemplation. I love how all these students seem to know Reese on a first name basis. Reese, I saw his body. Thank you, Reese. Reese is played by Loretta Devine, who turns out was overqualified for the part. And I'm not even talking about her starring role in Dreamgirls on Broadway. Devine was a dormitory director at Brandeis University in the 1970s. I had some insight naturally on what it was like to, to, to run a facility to check on the young people that are around you and just how goofy and how some of the dumb stuff they do. With Damon's body missing, Natalie has no proof for the faculty or her friends. Parker assures her Damon just totaled his car as a harmless prank. Don't you guys get it? Come on, it's just like that urban legend. Natalie realizes Michelle Mancini also died in urban legend style, so she starts to put this movie's premise together. It's like someone out there is taking all these stories and making them reality. Natalie's on edge, and it doesn't help that her Castle Dracula dormitory has got a creepy janitor slinking around. Also doesn't help that her vampire roommate Tosh is always angrily smoking and angrily banging dudes in their room. Shut up! Then why even have a fucking light at all? These are two more horror vets, with the janitor played by Julian Richings of Cube fame. He'd go on to originate Three Finger in the first wrong turn. Tosh is played by Danielle Harris, of course, kid and adult actor in various Halloweens, and a pretty good pumpkin carver. Tosh is so goth, she spends all her time on gothforgoth.com. Not even shitty 56k can keep her from making clip art connections. She starts I-M-ing with someone who says they're real close by. In fact, the instant messages are coming from inside the room! When Natalie gets home, she hears a bunch of moaning, but assumes Tosh is getting point owed. She doesn't bother turning the lights back on before she goes to sleep. It's not until morning that she learns Tosh was being murdered, and ain't no web redemption gonna bring her back. Danielle Harris, who had been real-life college roommates with Tara Reid, had to shoot her death scene with a dislocated knee. Because my klutzy ass literally fell in a pothole crossing the street. In reference to an urban legend about leaving the lights off during a murder, the killer leaves a taunting message for Natalie on the wall. Mean thing to do, but not half as mean as the shit their classmates say about Tosh. Better check her Paul. She's looked like that for years. Damn, that bathroom chick from Scream's got competition for cattiest character. Dean Adams and Reese still don't believe Natalie that there's a murderer. They blame Tosh's death on suicide, since she was taking lithium, and assume that Damon's off on a trip with friends for the weekend. It's the weekend. He's probably shacked up in some motel with a girl. Or a guy. Farm animal, whatever. Natalie teams up with Paul and tells him her urban legend serial killer theory. The idea of an urban legend serial killer? It's a stretch. Could never carry a horror franchise. But Natalie points out that these murders are coinciding with the 25th anniversary of the Stanley Hall Massacre, Pendleton's own urban legend involving the giant abandoned dorm in the middle of campus. As we learned from Parker earlier, the legend goes that a professor went mad and became a door-to-door -door stabsman. Paul's skeptical that the Stanley Hall Massacre even happened, but still agrees to snoop around with Natalie. While hunting for clues, they talk to the joyless janitor. How long you been working here? Too damn long. You know anything about Stanley Hall? He'd rather have a beer. The creepy custodian gives them Wexler's name, so they head to his office and promptly break inside. Doesn't take too much trifling to find a parka hanging up in a hidden room, the contents of which include a murder axe. They're caught by Wexler and taken to the dean, who gets Paul fired from the newspaper. Wexler says the axe is just a prop he uses in class, and the parka? I don't know, I guess everyone on campus has got one of those. Including a random swimmer chick who Natalie thinks is going to kill Brenda. Really? You two see a woman breaking a window with a chair, and that's your reaction? Natalie admits to Brenda that she went to high school with Michelle Mancini, but says they stopped talking after an incident that happened in a Dutch-angled, bleach-bypassed flashback. They were pretending to do the high-beam gang initiation, urban legend. So she turned the headlights off and waited for the first part. Pass by and flash us. Michelle got a little too committed to the bit and ran the driver off the road, killing him instantly. Remember kids, urban legends, not even once. Brenda says she wants to cheer Natalie up by taking her to a frat party held in commemoration of the Stanley Hall Massacre. All right, let's go! Dean Adams is leaving for the weekend, doing his due diligence to avoid becoming another urban legend victim. But he fails to check under the car, so he winds up with his Achilles tendon sliced apart. It wasn't a hostile undead baby holding that knife, 
safe. It was the thing from the thing poster, who now lets gravity finish the job. In a memorable kill, the Dean tries to crawl out of the parking lot, but gets run over and impressed upon the wrong way spikes. Not even tenure can save you from severe everything damage. For this kill, production used a strip of rubber spikes with a few missing so the actor could lie between them. The late John Neville, best known as the titular role in The Adventures of Baron Munchausen, had to actually lie down on the pavement as a raised Mercedes drove over him. They had to shoot it a bunch of times, and by the end, the 73-year-old actor was sick of being tread on. He was a pro. He got the scenes done, and as soon as he's finished, peace out, I'm out. He used more colorful language than that. Go fuck yourselves. <laughs> At the Massacre Anniversary frat party, we get more legends sprinkled in, like the one about the scream in Love Roller Coaster. That scream? That's an actual cry for help by a girl being murdered. Thanks, random guy with four lines. Why don't you go put on Wizard of Oz and point out the munchkin that hangs himself? It's just a crane, people! Parker's one of these sorority boys and hazes his dog Hootie by making him drink from a beer bong. Hey. Don't get any ideas. Paul shows up to tell Natalie he's learned some things. The Stanley Hall massacre was real, and its sole survivor was a future Professor Knife Hands. Happy to be alive! Paul thinks Wexler has gone crazy and is responsible for the recent murders. He apologizes for doubting Natalie, which leads to a face grab and a kiff. That's when Brenda walks in with the only beer mugs ever used at frat parties. She storms off, mad that she doesn't get to be Paul's Harley Quinn. There, there, Brenda. It's okay. That dude is really weird. Pup abuser Parker gets a phone call from the killer using a fake voice. You're gonna die tonight. But the faux face ain't calling to talk about scary movies, they're staying on brand and referencing urban legends. This is the one about the old lady who dries her wet dog in the microwave. In a brutal moment for this otherwise mostly fun film, Parker discovers the carcass of his drunk dog in the microwave. Christ, that's ruthless even by dog murder standards. As he's vomiting up his disgust at someone out abusing his dog, Parker's attacked and force-fed Pop Rocks. But we already know that's just a- Oh, the killer makes it lethal by swapping out the soda for fucking Drano. When they're done, Parker's insides are the cleanest thing left in this bathroom. Across campus, Reese interrupts the janitor's lurking break to poke around Wexler's office. She discovers it looking like a nightmare, with his teaching axe gone and enough blood on the floor to do a Three Stooges routine. Back at the party, Natalie listens to Sasha's show on the radio. Sasha had been there earlier, but left in the rain sounding like Carolyn Weiger during a challenge. <laughs> The party must be close to the broadcasting station, because the killer is already there, murdering Sasha's technician in the blurry background. We saw that guy earlier, but I don't think he had any lines. Just a chuckle as Sasha filleted her microphone. The killer then begins chasing Sasha with their axe, and her screams are broadcast across the airwaves. Thankfully, not James Gunn is back to say that the screams are just some kind of performance art. She's good, I got chills. Natalie ain't buying it, so she rushes over to the station as Sasha goes through a pretty great chase scene. I love the shots of her face reflected in the parka and looking up through the frosted glass floors. The best part of the chase is on this staircase that reminds me of East Hall at U of M. Tara Reid did all her own stunts in this sequence, including one with a real axe that nearly hit her in the face. She also hung from that high up staircase on cables. After every shot, they'd call Cud and push this high scaffolding beneath her for safety. Natalie arrives just in time to see Sasha get cornered by the Patagonia pursuer. I don't want to die. Too bad! Sasha is killed with three vicious axe swipes from the killer as Natalie looks on helplessly. At least she gets a twinkle fingers wave. Natalie finds Paul, who's looking damp, with suspicion. Doesn't help that he's always touching her face, that guy. She stifles her fears for now, and the two run into Brenda out in the rain, as Reese stumbles upon Sasha's body and confirms that there's a killer afoot. Or er, a hand? The soggy love triangle, ew, stops at a remote gas station. And while Paul checks on the taquito situation, the ladies hear a little ringtone coming from the back. Ah <laughs> shit, yeah, that one's a banger. Perfect for synchronized getting out of the car. They open the trunk to find a hacked up Professor Wexler. Wow, great trunk space on that ride. Finally noticing that Paul is played by Jared Leto, Natalie and Brenda run for their lives. They get split up when Brenda falls behind, so Natalie is alone when she gets to a road and calls for an Uber the prehistoric way. Turns out the creepy janitor's got a side hustle, and his rideshare amenities include a fur-lined coat in case of cold. It is ridiculous how everyone's got this coat in their possession, especially when it doesn't seem like it's cold outside. 
Urban Legend was supposed to take place in winter, but they changed it to avoid dealing with snow. The killer's fashion statement is a remainder from that early idea. As Natalie tries to jump out of a moving vehicle, the janitor sees a gang member in a wagoneer. He flashes his lights, just like in the Urban Legend, and before you know it, they've got a coded competitor in this dangerous car race. The killer rams the truck off the side of the road, and while Natalie's fine, the janitor dies just like he lived off-puttingly and mostly unnoticed. The completely unscratched Natalie runs all the way back to Murder Hall, where she hears Brenda screaming from inside. With no time to wait for recent forcements, she heads inside to save her friend on her own. She breaks into the abandoned raternity and follows Brenda's voice to door number one. Oh god, are those suds from the Drano in his guts? Or has the killer been bathing his corpse? Regardless, not good. Things go from bad to slightly better when she realizes Dean Adams is dead. And then way, way worse when she opens a closet to find out the Cenobites are in town. Damon's dead body is blocking such sights to show her, like Brenda killed in ritual sacrifice to Yankee Candle. She looks a lot like Annie's body splayed out in Halloween. And as for the candles, director of photography James Chrysanthus said he was directly inspired by the 1983 Gregory Nava film, El Norte. Too bad this is a crypt of lies. After a Mikey My My sit-up, Brenda's fist says, psych! Yep, Brenda's the killer. A fact that was hidden in the Pendleton crest made by the late production designer, Charles Breen. In Latin, it says, the best friend did it. This is when urban legend kicks it up a notch, since Rebecca Gayhart gets to wild out. I'm sorry, but I can't understand a thing you're saying, doll. I fucking love it. Although at the risk of sounding like a broken record, it's definitely scream inspired. Hell, she even cribs one of Billy's Line deliveries. Why? 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 Can't say she doesn't put her own unique stank on it though. Lucky for you, Miss Thang. Rebecca Gay Hart fought through multiple rounds of screen tests and auditions for this role. To make her a less obvious suspect, production tamed her naturally curly locks until the reveal. There's a lot of talk about my hair being curly or straight, and did I did my curly hair give it away? Yeah, everyone knows curly hair is a sure sign of a serial killer. How many bodies are you hiding, Al? Brenda reveals her motive in the most horrifying way possible. A slideshow. Turns out the guy Michelle and Natalie accidentally killed was Brenda's high school sweetheart. You know, David and I were gonna get married that summer. Right after graduation. Yeah, that would have lasted. Since her boyfriend was killed via urban legend, Brenda's been killing people the same way. She's got something special in store for Natalie. Just my favorite UL. Stop trying to make UL happen, Brenda. For her piece de fino kill, Brenda's going to cut out Natalie's kidney, like in the legend where a person wakes up in an ice bath. That is, if she can find the kidney. Although I guess it doesn't really matter. First organized C, I'm just gonna grab it. She starts poking around when Reese makes her heroic entrance. The C-section is aborted, but Brenda's still swipes at Reese with a knife and shoots her in the side with her own gun. Brenda settles on killing Natalie with a boring gunshot, but she's interrupted again, this time by a slow clap and Paul. Very well done. Shut up, Paul. He tries to use Brenda's love for him to say he's on her side, but she doesn't fall for it. Not that fucking cute. While she's eeny meeny mining her next kill, Reese mows her down with a gunshot from the floor. Natalie then grabs the gun and does the final honors herself, shooting Brenda out a window where she falls in a prom night sort of way. I love the little moment of honesty from Nat here. You all right? No. They call for medical help for Reese and take off in the rain to get meta with the ending. So if this is an urban legend, at what point do we get to the twist? Right about now, motherfucker! Brenda's back to her axe swinging ways, but Paul slams the brakes and sends her flying out the windshield, over a bridge and down into the water, in a terror train sort of way. They watch as Brenda's body floats on, all right. Huge props to Rebecca Gayhart's stunt double, Shelly Cook, who had to fly through a windshield and do this fall off an actual bridge. She also had to dive through a boarded up window in the Stanley Hall scene and take another fall when they cut to the action outside the building. Cook continues used to work in stunts, often as a coordinator, and was involved in Saw's Five Through Spiral. Paul and Natalie share a wet embrace that dissolves into a scene in the nearby future. We're at a new college, where everyone's dressed like they wandered off the set of a Smash Mouth video. This new group of kids is also weirdly obsessed with urban legends, which now include Brenda's Pendleton murders. And Brenda's a girl in that Noxzema commercial. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, actually, yes, that is correct. The movie ends with an expert telling them to get their facts straight. Okay, listen up, guys. Because this is how the story really goes. Legends can be fun and all, but I'm more interested in cold, hard numbers. So let's get to them, right after I disprove a popular UL.
Ten people died in urban legend. Seven were men and three were women, giving us a chilly blue pie chart. Brrrr. Hey, pie chart, better put a park on. <laughs> yeah, that's better. I was surprised to learn we've only seen this count in gender breakdown four times before on this show. I thought it'd be more. With a runtime of 100 minutes, that left us with a kill on average every 10 minutes even. I'll give the golden chainsaw for coolest kill to Dean Adams. It's a great way to use something we're all at least a little scared of in real life. Intrusive thoughts telling me to shift into reverse. Dom machete for lamest kill goes to Sasha Sound Engineer. Poor guy spent his Friday night devoted to campus media, and this is how he gets repaid? And that's it. Urban Legend came out in 1998 and made a higher profit for Phoenix Pictures than any other movie they had made at that point. It ensured a sequel would be made, and I'll look at that next week. Until then, I'm James A. Janice. This has been The Kill. Thanks a lot for watching this Kill Count. This is our dog Molly, and if you didn't meet her already, then I know you didn't watch the Frogs or Bones in All Kill Counts or any of the recent podcasts, you fake fan. Nah, I'm just kidding, it's cool. She's a sweet little baby when she's not fucking barking, and uh, her and Lucy, Still, very skeptical of each other. We are slowly bribing them to love each other with treats. Okay, you've earned your rent this month. I want to thank some patrons like Kelly Quinquies, Stephen Sherrier, Romy Kazi, Karen Doran, Kyle Sargent, Jasper Lacey and Linda, Cerise Nova, Cynthia Zhang, Andrea Jacobson, Rio Vivo, and Jason Pendergast. Got a lot of catching up on those to do. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Be good people.